In today's episode of Unsolved Mysteries, we're going to be diving in into a decade-old disappearance case from Portland, Oregon, known as the Disappearance of Chiron Horman. What's interesting about this case is that a seven-year-old boy mysteriously vanished after attending a school science fair, which sparked the largest criminal investigation in Oregon history. So, who is Chiron Horman? How did he disappear? Also, is Chiron even alive? These are questions that still need answers, but let's dive deep into the clues to come up with our own theories and speculations. Let's get into this case now. On June 4th, 2010, Chiron was taken to school by his stepmother, Terry Horman, who then stayed with him while he attended a science fair. That morning, he put on his glasses and CSI TV show t-shirt, and Terry took his picture next to his green cardboard project display of the quote, red-eyed tree frog at the pre-class science fair. However, he was never seen in his first class and was instead marked as absent that day. Terry's statements to the police indicated that after leaving the school at 8.45 a.m., she ran errands at two different Fred Mayer grocery stores until about 10.10 a.m. and that she last remembered seeing Kyron walking down the hall to his first class. Between then and 11.39 a.m., Terry stated that she was also driving her daughter around town in an attempt to use the motion of the vehicle to soothe the toddler's earache. Terry said that she then went to a local gym and worked out until about 12.40 p.m. Then by 1.21 p.m. she had arrived home and posted pictures of Kyron at the science fair on Facebook. At 3.30 p.m., Terry and her husband Kane walked with their daughter Kiara to the bus stop to meet Kyron. The bus driver told him that the boy had not boarded the bus after school and to call the school to ask about his whereabouts. Terry immediately did so, only to be informed by the school's secretary at first that as far as anyone there knew, Kyron had not been at school since early that day and he had been accordingly been marked absent. Realizing then that the boy was missing, the secretary immediately called 911 and the search for Kyron Horman began. The search efforts for Chiron were extensive and primarily focused on a two-mile radius around Skyline Elementary and on Sovi Island, which is approximately six miles away from the school. Law enforcement did not disclose their reasons for searching around the Sovi Island area, but one of the areas included a search around the Sovi Island Bridge. But on June 9, 2010, the Horman family who had initially refused to speak with the media released a statement to the press. They stated, quote, Kyron's family would like to thank people for support and interest in finding their son. The outpouring of support and continued effort strengthens their hope. We need for folks to continue to assist us in our goal. Please search your properties, cars, outbuilding, sheds, etc. Also check with neighbors and friends who may be on vacation or may need assistance in searching. There were a lot of resources here to help you search, so please don't stop. It is obviously a difficult time and they want to speak to the public so you can hear from Chiron's family as they come together to share their message. Their objective is to keep the focus on Chiron and not about anything else." End quote. On June 12, around 300 trained rescuers were on the ground searching for wooded areas near Skyline Elementary. Their search for Chiron, which spanned over 10 days, was the largest in Oregon history and included over 1,300 searchers from Oregon Washington, and California. A reward was posted for information leading to the discovery of Chiron, which was initially $25,000 and expanded to $50,000 in late July 2010. His disappearance was so huge that it even went on the national news from the very beginning and led every single local newscast for the first three months. The case was also covered on well-known television shows like Oprah, Dr. Phil, Dateline, Good Morning America, the Today Show, Nancy Grace, and every news program and news magazines in Portland. By November 29, 2010, search efforts in Kyron's case had cost an estimated $1.4 million, according to the county commissioners, and yielded 4,257 tips. So right from the get-go, there were many concerns for Kyron's whereabouts, 
and whether he is dead or alive. But before we dive into the theories, let's first dive into the history of Kyron Horman and his family. Kyron Richard Horman was born on September 9, 2002 in Portland, Oregon to Desiree Young, the mother, and Kane Horman, the father, who was an engineer for Intel. Desiree and Kane Horman divorced eight months into her pregnancy with Kyron, with Desiree citing irreconcilable differences. The two had later granted shared custody of Kyron until 2004, but when Desiree was diagnosed with kidney failure that required extensive medical intervention, Kane took over full custody. However, Desiree still remained an active part of Kyron's upbringing. In 2007, Kane married Terry Moulton, born on March 14, 1970, a substitute teacher originally from Roseburg, Oregon. Kane became romantically involved with Terry around 2001 when he and Desiree were in the midst of divorcing. Kane and Terry eventually married in 2007 while in Kauai, Hawaii, and in December 2008, Terry gave birth to a daughter, Kiara. The Hormans seemed like a normal, ordinary family, and things started to look promising for this couple until life started to get more difficult. According to a one-on-one -on -one interview with The Oregon, Kane Horman said, quote, I thought the marriage was doing pretty well until we had our daughter, Kiara, end quote. Kane said he thought his marriage to Terry Moulton Horman fractured within six months after she gave birth in November 2008, which resulted in Terry getting postpartum depression. Terry Horman was therefore placed on medication for the depression, and her doctor strongly recommended for Kane to keep an eye on her to make sure she was okay. But in reality, Terry was far from okay. It was mentioned by Kane that Terry would have a lot of emotional outbursts and would at times lash out at her family, which included Chiron Horman. But now that we know the background of the Horman family, let's dive into the theories as to what happened to Chiron Horman. The first theory is that Kyron Horman was kidnapped and the one responsible is his stepmother, Terry Horman. According to Terry's friends, she was upset with Kane in the months leading up to Kyron's disappearance because Kane made her teenage son James move out of the house in February 2010. He was living with Terry's parents in Roseburg at the time of Kyron's disappearance. Kane and James did not get along and would often argue, and Kane felt that he was causing tension in the household, causing Terry unnecessary stress and not helping her depression. One theory, which seems far-fetched, is that Terry was so angry with Kane that she wanted to get back at him by harming Kyron. This could be part of a combination of reasons for Terry harming Kyron, possibly combined with her depression, but it seems very unusual for that to be the sole reason for her wanting Kyron gone. But this is where the suspicion for Terry becomes even more apparent, because in late June 2010, in the midst of the investigation into Kyron's disappearance, Kane Horman was purportedly told by investigators that Terry had offered their landscaper, Rudolfo Sanchez, quote, a lot of money to kill him after she complained to him that her husband had physically and mentally abused her. Sanchez testified in deposition that Terry approached him to help kill her husband in January 2010, five months before Kyron's disappearance, but when Terry's attorney, Stephen House, asked if Terry had asked him to kill her husband, he ultimately said no. However, it was later learned that the DA told Sanchez that his family would be deported if he didn't participate in a sting and testimony. So investigators convinced Sanchez to confront Terry while wearing a wire, but they were unable to obtain any evidence and could not make an arrest. Then on June 28, Kane filed for divorce and obtained a restraining order against Terry, mainly due to Terry trying to hire a landscaper to kill him. And soon enough, the divorce was granted and Terry was eventually granted a supervised visitation with her daughter Kiara. But what's even more strange is that during the investigation, Terry had failed two separate polygraph examinations regarding Kyron's disappearance. In August 2010, it was announced that law enforcement were searching for an individual allegedly seen by two witnesses sitting inside Terry's truck outside Skyline Elementary the day of Kyron's disappearance. Bruce McCain, a former sheriff for the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, told CBS News, quote, The identity of that second person, if he or she existed, could be critical in determining what happened to Kyron after 9 a.m. on June 4th, end quote. Meanwhile, in July 2010, a Multnomah County grand jury subpoenaed several friends of Terry Horman, including D.D. Spitcher, whom Young and Kane Horman described as having been in close communication with Terry and providing Terry with support and advice that is not in the best interests of Kyron. According to law enforcement, Spitcher was extremely cooperative and allowed search of her property and her car, as well as enduring three hours worth of questioning from detectives. On the day of Kyron's disappearance, 
Spitzer abruptly left her work gardening for a homeowner at their residence on Germantown Road in northwest Portland around 11.30 a.m. and returned around 90 minutes later. She allegedly helped Terry purchase an untraceable cell phone, which sparked even more suspicion for Terry as the prime suspect. But during this time, Spitzer told journalists, quote, There's this horror that my friend is going through. If I thought for a second that she was capable of foul play, I would have not been there. She would have not been my friend in the first place. End quote. Then in early August 2010, both Young and Kane were subpoenaed and testified during the grand jury, as well as having the school principal of Skyline Elementary. Then fast forward to December 2010, it was reported by the Oregonian that the grand jury had yet to provide compelling evidence yielding a potential indictment, leaving the disappearance case to go colder. Then on June 1, 2012, Kyron's mother, Desiree Young, filed a civil lawsuit against Terry, claiming that she was responsible for the disappearance of Kyron. The lawsuit attempted to prove that Terry had kidnapped Kyron on the day that he disappeared, and Young sought $10 million in damages from Horman. However, on August 15, 2012, a federal court judge denied a motion by Terry to delay the lawsuit. But this is where the case gets even weirder. Remember how Terry Horman failed two polygraph examinations? Well, fast forward to early October 2012, Spitcher was called to answer 142 questions during a deposition regarding Young's lawsuit against Terry. Among these questions were ones regarding Spitcher's whereabouts on June 4, 2010, and her contact with Terry that day. But she refused to answer any of those questions and also declined to identify a photo of Kyron, whether she had met him before or not, and whether she knew his father, Kane. So if Terry Horman was to actually kidnap Kyron, was her friend Spitcher also involved as an accomplice? Or does she know information about the investigation that no one knows about? The Oregon law enforcement could not find any conclusive evidence to act upon that suspicion, and on July 30, 2013, it was announced that Young had dropped the lawsuit against Terry so as to not interfere with the ongoing police investigation. Desiree told the media that in the months leading up to her son's disappearance, quote, Kyron became increasingly unhappy about not spending time with me. He wanted to come and live with us. Several times he would just break down and just sob because he wanted to stay." End quote. So what other possible explanations could be there for Kyron's disappearance? Well, the second theory is that Kyron was kidnapped by an unknown party. As mentioned before, Terry Horman was interviewed by Dr. Philip McGraw during his live show in September 2016. She mentioned that she believes the boy was kidnapped by a man in a white pickup truck, and it was the first time Terry has ever publicly shared what she believes happened to Kyron on June 4, 2010, after she says she dropped the boy off at Skyline Elementary School, literally six years after the incident. She told Dr. Phil that the employees at a 7-Eleven on Highway 30 spotted a suspicious man lurking around, and at one point, the man even asked Horman where the nearest school was. Eventually, an employee from a 7-Eleven told him about Skyline Elementary and immediately informed police about the suspicious man, but that nobody ever followed up on the tip. The rest of the interview consisted primarily of Terry Horman rebutting claims made by Kyron's biological parents, Desiree Young and Kane Horman, on the same program three years prior. Young has made accusations that the boy's stepmother was behind his disappearance and that she had a grudge against Kyron for causing a rift in Terry's marriage with her husband, Kane. But this theory seems very improbable for one main reason. And that reason is that out of all the children at Skyline Elementary School, why did the man kidnap specifically Kyron Horman? Did the Hormans have any enemies or recently encounter anyone that would motivate someone to kidnap their child? Well, according to Kane and Desiree, it seems like the person who would be in the best interest to do so is Terry Horman herself. Because throughout the whole investigation, no further names were brought up as possible suspects other than hers. But let's assume that Terry Horman is 100% innocent and that Kyron was actually kidnapped by someone completely unrelated. What would be the kidnapper's motivation? The Hormans before the incident weren't exactly a high profile family that had fame or even had an enormous amount of money. And if money was to be the main motivator, why hasn't a ransom been sent to the Hormans? Because that seems to be like the next probable step if kidnappers were to demand money. So does that mean the Oregon police are dealing with a potential serial kidnapper who likes to target specifically children? Well, on August 11, police held a press conference in which they appealed for information regarding Terry's Ford F-250 pickup truck she was driving the day Kyron disappeared. They had two witnesses come forward saying that they had seen another adult sitting in the truck. Thinking perhaps this individual could have been Dee Dee, 
They handed out flyers with pictures of Terry, Dee Dee, and the truck asking that anyone with information please come forward. Investigators were specifically interested in sightings which took place between 9.45 a.m. and 1 p.m. and their interests in sightings were not limited to Dee Dee, but rather they wanted descriptions of any other adults inside the truck or who appeared to be lingering near it. But on August 18, however, it was reported by Portland news station Katu 2 that investigators had reasons to believe it may not have been Dee Dee seen in the truck that day, leaving the investigation of the white truck to go cold. But in my honest opinion, I think the person who kidnapped Kyron was likely someone who he trusted or someone who was able to gain his trust. Otherwise, there would have been some struggle luring Kyron into the vehicle, especially where it's somewhere public like Skyline Elementary School. Overall, the disappearance of Kyron Horman is truly strange and tragic. It doesn't make any sense that a 7-year-old boy would just suddenly disappear at a public elementary school, especially when his mother-in-law has failed two polygraph exams in regards to his disappearance. But nonetheless, this case serves as a reminder for us to always look out for our loved ones because you may never know who might take them away when you're not careful. So, was Kyron Horman actually kidnapped? If so, who exactly kidnapped him? Also. Is he even still alive? These are questions that still need answers, hence why this case is still unsolved. Hey guys and gals, this is Mr. Shin Ramen, and I just want to thank you for making it this far. Did you enjoy the video? If so, it would be greatly appreciated if you can leave a like on this video and subscribe to this channel for more future content. Till next time. Stay safe and stay scared.